We've come to this word multiple times on Sunday morning and many times on, on Wednesday night if you've been a part of our James study. Every time we come to it, we have to stop and remember the context. Paul is speaking to believers. That's what first and foremost this term implies. It is brothers and sisters or, or siblings in Christ. So this letter, once again, as a reminder, because we've been in here a long time, is to Christians. So I won't belabor that particular point, but what I want us to notice here in this context is in the middle of what he's talking about here, in pressing on for the prize, he pauses just for a moment to, to address the audience. Brothers, brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, those who are in this fight with me, those who are together alongside me, the ones that I love and care for and who love and care for me back. Notice, as you're reading through this entire section, really beginning all the way back in the beginning of chapter 3, Paul's willingness here to be transparent with his brothers. I mean, some of the things he's talked about, I don't know if I would want to share that with people. My past, where I've been, what I've done. But in this transparency, he is reminding them and reminding himself, I think, even. You are my brothers. Fellow Christians, those who have been chosen by Christ, Paul is setting an example here for us. Brothers and sisters, in this church, we have each other in this life <laughs> to be side by side together with. We can be real with one another. We don't have to be fake about who and what we are. We should be able to be real with one another, to help one another, as we are all straining forward together in our sanctification as Christ's own people. We shouldn't be worried about what one another think in the church. What are they going to think about me? We already realize how broken and sinful we are. And therefore we can look at one another with love and desire to help one another and care for one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ. I am right there with you, fighting the same fight against sin and self and the enemy in this world, brothers. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. So here we are uh, pushed backwards again. We've got to know what he's talking about. I do not consider I have made it my own. Remember what we talked about last week. I have... Not that I have already obtained this. Again, the resurrection from the dead, or, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. So once again, Paul, as he stated earlier in the chapter, says the same thing again, repetition, for the sake of emphasis and to remember this truth. He says, I do not consider... I do not count, I do not reckon that I have made it my own, I have, that, I, that I have been perfected yet, that I have attained the resurrection from the dead yet. I really do, again, we talked about Paul's humble confession of reality last week, I really understand the circumstance, I really understand the situation, I really understand myself, I have not made it my own. I do not consider that I have made it my own. I humbly confess, as we talked about last week, that God is holy and I am still a sinner, that I am being sanctified, that I have been chosen by Christ, and that a future glory awaits me. I know who and where and what I am. I do not consider that I have made it my own. But, 
but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. And I've got three sections here in these two verses that I want us to talk about. Forgetting the past, straining in the present, and looking to the future. First we see here, forgetting the past. One thing I do, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. Paul is telling us here, by his own example, we must forget our past. This is something we need to learn how to do. We don't just get it. Now, what am I talking about? We're not talking about forgetting all your past. There are plenty of things that we must remember. And even the scripture tells us again and again, in many ways and in many times and many places, to remember important things. We're not talking about some futuristic mind wipe where we have no memories left. That's not the point here. Paul's not saying, I have forgotten everything from this point beforehand. I have wiped my memories clean. That's, that's not what he's talking about here. That's not the point. He says, forgetting what lies behind. Remember he, the, the context. Don't, don't take this out of context. He's already shared some of the behind stuff. It's that stuff that is, is temporal, not eternal. Remember the context back in verses 4, and six, four through 6 is, is what Paul used to be, what he used to trust in, what he used to do, the life he used to live before he was in Christ. This life before Christ was shameful. It was embarrassing, humiliating, to think back on. Now as a maturing Christian, and we all have that, all of us who are in Christ, if we look back to our past before Christ, have things that are shameful, embarrassing, humiliating, and ultimately sinful. So remember, Paul's past here. He gave it to us in verse 4 through 6. He was a persecutor of the church. Part of his, his job was to charge Christians with blasphemy and ultimately put them to death. You think your past is bad. Paul killed Christians. I know some of y'all's past. shameful embarrassing humiliating sinful but I know my past shameful embarrassing humiliating sinful we all have things that lie behind us that we are ashamed of, that we wish would have been different. But we must realize that in God's sovereign wisdom and plan, in working all things together, those are the things that led us to this moment today. Now that doesn't make them less shameful or, or sinful, and it definitely doesn't remove the consequences of those things that we have done, but it gives it all meaning. God has brought us through those things to show us the immeasurable grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So we can either look back and wallow in our pity or we can forget what lies behind. Knowing what it was, really what it was, but knowing that in Christ it has all been forgiven by His blood, by His grace, and His grace alone. If Paul could choose to forget what lies behind by grace through faith in Christ, so can we. We have what he has, or had, 
I guess still has. <laughs> We have the Spirit of God in us. We have the election that He has. We have been chosen by God. We have been united with Christ. We have the same thing Paul had. And if he could forget what lies behind, so can we. You and I can forget what lies behind. First, we must choose to forget. How can I forget? Well, first you've got to choose to forget. We must put off the old man. We must stop by bringing up the sins of the past and giving, us, giving ourselves a sense of false guilt. Christ paid the sin debt for those sins. Stop making yourself feel guilty about something you're not guilty of anymore. We continue to bring, bring up what Christ died for as if His sacrifice wasn't really enough. So we must choose to put off that way of thinking to be renewed in our minds, remembering the gospel of what Christ has done. We must choose to forget. If we're going to forget what lies behind, we must choose to forget. And then, because you all, I know you're all thinking the same thing. Well, I have chosen to forget it, but it keeps coming back. Well, you've got to practice it. You have to practice choosing to forget. It's going to keep coming. There will be times when your thoughts come to mind or when something is placed in front of you that makes you remember what you did and who you were. I'm reminded of a wonderful chorus. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. We must practice this. Remind ourselves to forget. <laughs> Continue to practice this when temptations come. To remember the gospel takes practice. We must remind ourselves of it. Choose to forget. Practice forgetting. But also remember that it is actually possible. Listen, I'm not just coming up with this idea. This is not something I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking and, and running with myself. He says, one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind. He's doing this. He has done this. He is choosing to forget. He is choosing to practice forgetting. He has made forgetting what lies behind His own. I have made this my own. It is possible to forget and press on as we look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And actually, Jesus made it very plain, and this, this one hurts a little. I've got to be honest. Luke chapter 9 in verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That was Jesus. Looking back is not what kingdom people do. So kingdom people... Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, we can actually choose to forget what lies behind. It is there. It really is there. But we can choose to keep our hands to the plow. Jesus said so. Now there is another part to forgetting, and it is the part of forgetting that most people forget to do. See what I did there? That's funny. Come on. Uh, we create habits of remembering our past and wallowing in them. 
We like self-loathing. It's a strong drug. And so it's easy for us to bring these things back again and again and begin to do the old man things again, the way we think, the way we speak, and what we do. We can't just break these habits by stopping doing them. Otherwise, we're just on vacation from them. And when we come, and we end up coming back, you can't stop them by breaking them only. They must be replaced. We learn that in, in, by, the, in, by what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, to put off the old man, to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, which we just talked about, but also to put on the new. Put off the old man, put on the new. Something must take its place. If we're going to forget the past and practice forgetting it, then it must be replaced by its righteous substitute. First, we remember the gospel, as we mentioned. That renews our mind. But instead of looking to the past, we must replace that with looking to the present and the future. You literally can't live in the past, and you know that. When we try to live in the past, we're not living in reality like we talked about last week. The past is gone. It can't be bought, brought back. So we must live right now. Be faithful right now. Obey God and love Him right now. So Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Paul doesn't just say he is trying really, really, really hard to forget the past. When we only spend time trying to forget the past, we end up spending all our time focused on the past. Paul says there's something ahead. In the next second, in the next minute, next hour, day, there is something else we must focus our attention on, and it is the straining forward, the pressing on that we must do here and now. As we focus our attention on our current responsibilities of life, and, as we will talk about in a minute, to the future, we will find that we will begin to forget the past more and more. It will have less time in our minds. The less attention it gets, the more it is forgotten. So we must forget what lies behind, forgetting the past we must strain forward or strain now in the present. Notice the words straining and press. Those, are, those imply something. It's difficult. Straining forward, pressing on. Paul doesn't sugarcoat it here. Life's tough. Life is hard. Life requires striving and pressing on. It is a marathon run. It is a battle. In other places, Paul uses, and we've, we've ta looked at these before, imagery of athletes and soldiers all the time to emphasize the difficulty and discipline required to live life. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 says this have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. We must discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Discipline ourselves towards godliness as its aim. It is difficult. It is straining. It is pressing on. So listen, 
brothers and sisters. We have our aim. We have our orders. We know what we should be striving for and pressing on to. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, as Paul said to the Corinthians here, So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. We don't just discipline ourselves. We do not strive aimlessly. We do not press on not knowing the direction. God has told us what we are to be doing. We're called to love God, love others, and make disciples. We must discipline ourselves towards these things with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So focus on these things. Strain forward in these things. Press on in these things. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Or like Paul told the Colossians and the Corinthians, whatever you do in word or deed, or whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do, Yes, everything. We get distracted by everything else. That's the difficulty. It is a strain to keep our eyes fixed on Christ and to keep ourselves focused on His commands. It is a striving. It is difficult. But remember, this work of striving, this process of sanctification as we have gone over and over again is progressive. We make progress. We are in process. We don't start out doing it well, just like you don't start riding a bike or playing piano well. It takes time and practice. Straining, it is an active verb to continue to do. Straining to make progress, to press on towards the goal. You know why we focus on the past? You know why we like to focus on the past? Because life is hard. Because living is difficult. Because striving towards Christ-likeness is hard. But, don't let that make you sad. Don't let that put you down. Difficult doesn't mean it's a chore or something that makes life harder or makes us sad, we still rejoice and thank God because He is the one working in us and using all that we go through for our good. He uses our disciplining ourselves, our striving, our pressing on for our good. It produces good things. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 through 14. For the moment, right now, In the disciplining of ourselves, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Amen. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, verse 12 says, lift your drooping hands. And strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Don't go, oh, woe is me. I just have to keep straining. Strengthen your knees. Lift your drooping hands. Press on. Because there is joy, there is peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We can still rejoice and thank God that He is working in us with all His power, as Philippians 2 tells us, to will and to work for His good pleasure. Though straining to follow Christ is hard, it is a great joy. And that is Paul's attitude in all this. Over and over again in this letter, joy is one of the wonderful, though secondary, benefits of straining in this life for Christ's sake. Brothers, 
I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So in forgetting the past and straining forward or straining in the present, we are now looking to the future. He says, for the prize. I press on. I, I strive. I press on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, which is our prize? Well, it is the salvation of the chosen ones through the gospel. There it is. Now, in the scriptures, you'll see two, to understand this properly, we, you'll see two different kinds of call. Two, two different kinds of calling. There's an, this, this upward call, it, it is, it, it, there, there's two different things to look at. First, there is a general call that goes out. It is the, the call of the gospel to all people. It is what God, again, in, in, in our aim of this life, to, to make disciples. He tells us to go out and preach the gospel to all people. That is a general call. It is an upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We are calling people to salvation through the gospel. We're telling them they are sinners, that Christ came to save sinners, and that if they will repent and believe the gospel, they will be saved. That is a general call. But then there is the effectual call of God that we cannot see. And that happens by the Holy Spirit who causes one who hears the general call to believe. To be born again to a new life in Christ Jesus, which begins at that moment of justification and continues in this life through sanctification and ends with final glorification with the resurrection from the dead, which Paul has been describing this whole time. This upward call of God in Christ Jesus is salvation to the end. It is salvation from beginning to end to, again, uh, seeking to attain to the resurrection of the dead, as verse 11 says. This is what he's talking about. This, this upward call is the call to salvation. And it is an upward call. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, that is, believers, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. It is an upward call in that we are called to look First, upward to the cross, to faith in the gospel of Jesus for our justification. It is an upward call in that we look up to Christ as our Lord and perfect example in our sanctification. And it is an upward call in that when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there in glory. We'll be there in glorification with a resurrected body from the dead. And so then what is the prize of this upward call? Because that already sounds pretty good. But it's the prize. I press on toward to the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It is God himself that is the prize. But we have God now, don't we? Well, yes. We already know God and, and we are loved by God. That's correct. But we are still hindered in fully enjoying our prize. And that's what God is going to do in glorification. He will make it so that we may fully enjoy Him forever. To fully realize the potential of what God has created us to be and to do for all eternity. And what is that? What is the chief end of man? What is our purpose? It is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him forever. 
That is what glorification, resurrection, the eternal state is for, so that we may attain the prize, that is, God Himself, the presence of God in perfect peace with the God of peace. Brothers and sisters, beloved, that is our prize. It is our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, able to enjoy Him to the fullest in the resurrection with all our senses, physically and mentally, body and spirit, forever and ever and ever and ever. That is the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So as we come to a close, remember these three things. We must forget the past. We must choose to. We must practice and we remember why. We must discipline ourselves in the present as we follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we must keep our eyes on the future. J. Adams said this, Faith has one eye fixed on the future and this affects the way that the other eye views the present. Brothers and sisters, God has called us upward, beloved. Let us not get distracted by the temporal things of this world, but with single-minded focus on God's promises to come, let us press on for the prize.